evening, everyone. If I could have your attention, we'll kick this off, and I'm very happy and also very proud to introduce Peter Testa tonight. Um, I am sure that you all know where he comes from, and um, it's going to be very exciting to see the work that he's undertaking at the moment with colleagues in LA and at SciArc. Um, Peter is the founding partner and design principal at Testa and Weiser. Um, and his academic career spans two decades or more. Um, but before that, he was also a principal in charge um, at Alvar Cisa's office. And he um, was doing that for projects both in Europe and in the US. Um, the academic career includes his founding, being the founding director of uh, MIT's Emergent Design Group in 1997, um, that lasted to 2002 when um, Weiser and Testa relocated to LA. Um, before that again, Columbia University, he was a design critic at uh, both, has been at both Harvard and, and UPenn. He's been a, um, has had a professor chair at uh, University of California in Berkeley. But then since 2004, um, a senior faculty member at SciArc, where um, one part of, part of your home, I believe, is the Robot House, um, which is, quote, a platform for experimentation and speculation on the future of architecture. Now, it's something that um, SciArc would embrace for many of its um, activities and studios. Although here, also with technology, obviously, it gets a particular edge. Um, it's about investigating interactions and process sequences in both simulation and programming environment. Um, but not the least, also exploring design opportunities and uh, digital production uh, beyond the conventional. Um, that includes, for instance, um, uh, additive freeform fabrication with um, composite materials. And some of that work has been documented in a book that came out last year, Robot House, um, that also weds um, robotics in terms of fabrication with um, images, um, meaning a medium of representation in relationship to both architecture and then robotic fabrication. At Testan Weiser, so, and with his partner then, um, Devin Weiser, um, they have been doing groundbreaking work for um, at least two decades. Um, projects include Factor E, electric vehicle design and manufacturing complex for Peugeot and Citroën, um, the ZXT housing and mixed use towers in Shenzhen, China, XRNRG, these are all coded titles, <laughs> um, a water and energy infrastructure for NASA, uh, and Composite Order, a prototype building system for a consortium of manufacturers. And that brings me with admittedly a little nostalgia to um, um, a personal note on, on Peter and, and Devin's work. I've known about it since about um, 2000, and we met only very recently and even briefly in Montreal for the Greg Lynn show. It was a thing that Greg Lynn hosted there. And we were privileged to see the respective works that we've been taking part in being collected by the Canadian Centre for Architecture. And Peter's was the Carbon Tower in, um, from 2001. Um, and it's a project that represents his interests in the exchange between the digital and the physical and that continues today. Um, it was a project about what you yourself have you termed it a serious coding into the design process. Um, at the time it included scripting in C++, um, also some of the very very first um, MEL scripting for um, uh, Alias Studio and um, subsequently Maya and um, resulted in, amongst other things, a um, Weaver script that was made available for uh, everyone on the internet. 
And the project was also equally radical um, with respect to the visions for on-site robotic fabrication. And this was then um, envisioned to be done by robots moving about and um, protruding fiber-enforced composite materials um, for the construction of the tower. And it's pre precisely around these materials systems um, that our interests at the time merged. Um, however, Peter's contribution to this field um, was certainly far more incisive than I could say of my own. And precisely because it uh, had a, this practical edge and on a very, very advanced level. Um, effectuated also what I think we both sought to, to achieve, but certainly that my colleagues and I did not achieve. Um, and something that what Peter has referred to as introducing more friction into the digital, which still resides with this, the relationship between the digital and the physical. Um, and we're speaking about behavioral materials that in, an, in, an, in themselves could be considered com computational materials. And um, the work of Peter and colleagues at the time is still, to this day, hugely relevant for precisely the issues and the achievements that it embodied. And it's also a body of work that continues in various forms, both at SciArc, but I presume also in your practice. And I would also point out that it's work that basically um, anticipates and predates um, more recent engagements um, with the same type of problems. So we're speaking about um, um, you and a group of people who were able to um, peep into the future, so to speak. Um, if not, the future was already there, but we're speaking about a 15-year um, difference. Now. Peter's work has been, and this is just a very quick running through, exhibited at leading museums and galleries worldwide, and that includes shows in New York, Los Angeles, London, Paris, Tokyo, Beijing. He's author of three books, um, numerous papers, and um, they have been published internationally in art, architecture, design, engineering, as much as scientific journals. And he has held, received awards, the MIT Innovation Award, three Graham Awards, if I'm correct, and also the Design Arts Award for the, um, of the National Endowment for the Arts. And the London Times prof has profiled Peter um, as a design innovation leader, defining architecture and the art of building in the 21st century. We're very happy to have you here, Peter. Welcome. Uh, well, thank you so much, Johan. That was a very generous introduction. Um, uh, I, I understand that um, this is, uh, uh, there's two parts here, that tomorrow, seminar. So um, t this, this evening um, is going to be a little more formal uh, in terms of presentation uh, and um, uh, in, in, with the anticipation that we'll be able to have a more informal discussion, but I'm also very open to questions at the end of this session, uh, this presentation. So. Um, so my, uh, my talk is going, this evening is in two parts. So I'm going to first uh, introduce work affiliated with the uh, project that Johan spoke of, of the speculative design initiative at SciArc that we call Robot House. Um, and um, so that's the first part, which will be the majority of the presentation tonight. Uh, and the second part I'm going to introduce one project from our firm, uh, Test and Weiser, um, that's for an uh, ultra-compact EV factory for Peugeot Citroën that was mentioned, uh, as a way of instantiating some aspects of this larger research program that I'll be discussing. 
So, um, as a kind of introduction to this uh, material, um, that I find that contemporary architectural uh, discourse that uh, we find ourselves strangely now among uh, many revivals, okay, that we're experiencing a number of revivals of historicism, at least in the United States. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that I can speak to this universally, but in the context of the United States, we're finding uh, a number of revivals of historicism and even postmodernism. And I would argue also revivals of the digital um, and again also uh, the re-emergence of emergence, okay, of these various topics that from my perspective um, we've already uh, worked through, okay. Um, not to say they're not relevant and that also includes a number of different kinds of materialisms, okay, so these are in one could argue a number of revivals. So in this time uh, of search bots and an unprecedented number of what we can see as kind of reduplications, okay, that the digital produces all these reduplications and so does social media, that it would appear that to make the next move, okay, to bust out, if you will, a new move or a new set of moves will be exceedingly difficult, okay? which is why we're finding these, you know, these revivals. Um, so, and I believe that to do that, um, to make a move, will require, at least this is what I would like to argue, that it's going to require a new apparatus, a new apparatus of fiction, and a new ontology of representation, and a redefinition of the concept of authorship, at least those are the topics that I'm going to be addressing tonight. Those are the, my concerns in the work that we're uh, uh, working on for the past, let's say, five, six years. Um, so one thing that um, we, as architects, um, the most interesting work, I believe, that we make often comes from what we might call fictioning, uh, working with incomplete information. So for instance, the the references that Johan was making to uh, work that we were doing back in the 1990s was working very much with incomplete information, okay? When we had uh, less information than uh, necessary to, let's say, uh, establish a rigorous map of the territory. So this misreading, so architects generally uh, the more interesting work involves a kind of misreading and picking up the wrong information, okay? Uh, rather than a correct or specialized use of technology, right? So um, with that outlook, I want to argue for a, a practice, uh, a speculative design practice and generic aesthetics, which I would see now as a new normal, okay? This is what I would call the new normal, that operates by a co collision of concepts of both digitality and analogicity rather than a dialectics, okay? So I'm going to be talking about this notion of a kind of collision of concepts rather than a synthesis or dialectical uh, uh, set of uh, engagements trying to across, to resolve, let's say, contradictions. Um, so. Through the history of the discipline of architecture, the apparatus, and by apparatus I don't mean instruments only, I mean the whole body of knowledge, set of ideas and presuppositions that come along with, let's say, a project, uh, uh, that it's the apparatus that produces part of the real. In other words, we don't have access to the real, it's through apparatus that we gain access to a part of the real. And that architectural effects, one could argue, are the, if, are, are the product of different apparatus, okay? That the architectural effects require an apparatus of some form. So it's with an interest in constructing 
an apparatus of fiction or a collider of concepts, okay? In this case, a collider of concepts of analog and digital, analogicity and digitality, that we, we set up in 1910, that we spearheaded the Robot House, okay, uh, initiative at SciArc. And that, so what I'd like to do here is to offer um, a kind of high-level view of this project, um, rather than going into detail in projects, but rather to kind of come up and, to some extent, theorize the work after it's been produced, um, and to discuss this in terms of what I would understand to be a set of protocols, okay? What I'm calling protocols of the post-digital. Um, so I have seven of these uh, axioms. Um, that we're going to be, uh, uh, I'll just run through these seven different axioms. Uh, so the first one is uh, kind of counterintuitive, from fabrication to non-fabrication. So uh, I think one of the uh, most, in a way, difficult, uh, uh, for me it's kind of straightforward, but seems to be quite difficult to grasp for people, um, that there's such a fundamental assumption um, that as soon as one is presented with a robot, it's immediately understood to be about fabrication, okay? So that I think one of the more original aspects of this enterprise is that the focus of design here is shifted from digital modeling and fabrication to imaging, okay? That, um, our focus has been from the very beginning on imaging and a new ontology of representation. So to a certain extent, we don't really, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but we don't really care about robotics, okay? We work with robots, but they're a kind of MacGuffin, okay? They're a means of confronting a, a circumstance, okay? There are means of, that immediately foregrounds this issue of digital analog, okay? Because they immediately imply the uh, problem that's inherent in computing of how do I move outside of that, right? How do I move into the three-dimensional or physical, and how do I move back and forth, okay? So the robot presents you with that problem, and for that, it's of interest to us. So, but there are other research programs, most notably here in Germany uh, and at the ETH in Zurich, that have pioneered innovative robotic fabrication, and they do uh, 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 very interesting work and so on, but that's not our interest here. So based in Los Angeles, uh, between what's now uh, Silicon Beach, okay, Silicon Beach, or you could say Silicon Alley, Valley, but uh, between Silicon Beach and Hollywood, that's kind of our uh, uh, location, if you will, our context. Our interests and resources focus on representation, imaging, sensing, machine vision, and AI. So this is a conceptual position and apparatus that not only breaks with the industrial model of robotics, but more essentially challenges the idea of robotics as simply the next, as the logical next step in digital fabrication, okay? So, um, and as a means to close the gap between the digital and the physical, okay? So there's a kind of assumption, a kind of fear of this gap, okay, of the need to try to shut this down, to close it, to get, get a continuity there. Um, what, we're, what we thought was, what was exciting was to delay that, okay, was actually to leave that as, as a problem, right? To leave that, not necessarily as a problem, but maybe also as an opportunity um, to start to challenge some of the assumptions that are built into the digital and some of the, let's say, uh, lacunae in the digital. So rather than uh, try and close this um, by, let's say, creating this next logical step of, okay, we're going to now move to fabrication, so we bring robots, and that's going to basically close this and create a nice tight loop, okay? Um, so instead of placing robots um, in a shop, okay, in the in uh, a shop environment, like of, uh, an industrial, a replication of an industrial environment, what we did is we created a kind of clean room and design studio that was imagined. And this 
uh, is a, one uh, aspect of this is the idea of using multiple robots. Okay, at the time this was, you know, th these things are now becoming, I wouldn't say trivial, but more so. Um, at the time, the idea of working with multiple robots was extremely challenging, okay, because there was no tool set um, for this. Um, and also, uh, industrial robots generally don't have intersecting work spheres, so in order to avoid collisions. So we put as many robots as we could possibly get in as tight a formation as we could and combine different sizes, but mostly small robots. So at the time, this was seen as you know, an odd thing to do because everyone, as an architect, you say, well, I'm going to use a robot to build a building. I need a big robot. Okay, I'm going to be, I need the biggest robot I can get. I'm going to do high payload and so on. So our thought was, well, even if we are interested in, in in this ultimately in relation to other kinds of construction, we first need to really get a um, motion control, okay? We need to understand uh, synchronous and asynchronous motion and how to control it. So one of the things that we did here, which I'm not going to get into too much uh, in the technical side of this, but I think an important thing that we did was that we used uh, Maya um, as both simulation environment and motion control. And that this was the first time this was done. Uh, and we continued to use that among uh, other interfaces. But what was important in that is that we didn't want this to become a specialized domain, but rather something that, that students wouldn't have to learn yet a whole other tool set and then become robot people. Okay, that this idea was that this was an extension of design, a design, a new kind of design space. So um, it was imperative that we would have an interface that students at SciArc, Maya is, you know, the, the software, uh, especially, you know, seven, eight years ago, that was essentially uh, when someone would start a project, the first thing they would do is turn on Maya, right? That was basically their default. Um, so, and we wanted to also shake that up. Um, so we turn on Maya, but we're also now turning on a robot, okay? So the idea, for instance, of being able to connect a, a, a camera in Maya to a camera attached to the end of a robot changes your whole perspective of space, okay? So you're now looking through, um, you know, now there's something, you know, right, generally there's, you know, when we look around, there's all this action going on here, but as soon as I go around the back of this, there's nothing here. Now, that, that's actually not true, and I'll show you how this becomes a much different kind of space of speculation. So, okay, so from the start, we were intent on exploring this idea of synchronous motion and animation involving multiple robot systems in both virtual and physical space. So, um, Greg uh, Lynn has described Robot House as a fundamental study of coordinated motion and its possibilities for architecture and design. So this focus on modelization, virtualization, and fictionalization yields ultimately another idea of fabrication, okay? So the superposition of digital and analog uh, in our work challenges the endless repetition and reductive continuities uh, that have become, in a way, that have become the hallmark of algorithm-driven design as the most prevalent strain of digital practice today. So paradoxically, while focused on abstract design protocols, um, several breakthroughs um, in genuine breakthroughs in fabrication workflows have actually taken place in Robot House. Well, that wasn't our focus. It's sort of like this is fallout from action, okay? That, um, the different projects that we've pursued, these are all projects uh, with students 
um, that, the, that while we're focused on these protocols, that these innovations start to uh, fall out of this work uh, as, as they often involve contingent arrangements of the apparatus, as in this example here, phantom geometry. Uh, that's one of the earliest projects developed here um, and that established a new genre of mixed resolution, image-driven manufacturing. So these contingent models harness the discrepancy or non-correlation between digital and physical processes to create new protocols and workflows. So this kind of this notion of an image driven, in other words, one of the characteristics of this is there's no 3D model, okay? Um, we challenge ourselves to do away with 3D modeling, okay? Um, so essentially what we're doing is streaming live images um, to a material that's, uh, that's reactive, okay, that's able to, uh, uh, this is a resin that's able, that's photosensitive. So, Essentially, we can stream live information and change that image. That image could be something remote and so forth, and it could be uh, also modified during the course of the production of the object, which is something you don't do in 3D printing, okay? So this project is from, I believe, I don't know if there's a date on this to verify this, but this is at least six years old, okay? So six or seven years ago. Um, so this is an example of, you know, starting from, and this is often how innovation actually happens, is that you start from one, one point of view, one angle, and something else appears, okay? That's what I mean by contingency. Um, so the idea, our focus on imaging, doesn't necessarily mean that that doesn't produce physical things as well. Um, so um, this kind of image-driven model, as opposed to, uh, geometric descriptions uh, is enabled by a, by a robotic output of objects and computational input in a kind of looping workflow. So um, in, uh, in this, the robot, what I think is important is also that the robot's not used as an instance that needs to maintain its trace, okay, but is rather part of a more complex superposition of the digital and the analog. So. Um, to conclude, I think, this first axiom, um, non-fabrication, what we're calling non-fabrication, and that's intentionally, you know, what we would uh, present, you know, students with this is to say, well, this is, we're not going to, we're not going to make anything, okay? And that's kind of a, uh, upsetting, right? Because the, it kind of shakes up your assumptions, like, what do you mean we're not going to make anything? You've, we, we, we want to make stuff. We've got these robots, and so, you know, let's produce stuff. And our, our point is no, because that already suggests that you know what you want to do. That's what you do in a shop, okay? In a shop, you go into a, a wood shop, you know, with a piece of wood, and you know you're going to cut it, okay? You don't go in there and, and start to speculate on the inner structure of wood or so, okay? Um, so you, you, you're, you're too, it's very intentional, right? It's very, let's say, uh, has this kind of uh, very directional intention. And that's fine, but that's not speculation and that's not really about design. So, okay. So this idea of non-fabrication isn't intended to resolve, supplant, or substitute fabrication, but to demonstrate that it's possible to define design without perpetuating this kind of binary schism between digital and physical realms. So uh, moving on to the second axiom, from machine to generic matrix. So what we're here uh, attempting to do is to propose a new vision of the design interface as a whole, okay? Uh, in which digital and analog workspaces are not synthesized but cloned, okay? So this is a kind of fundamental proposition is of this idea of cloning workspaces, okay? So they're not synthesized. So, and that um, leaves us with this, creates a kind of uh, unilateral uh, duality in which uh, these two mo these modalities aren't paired or opposed but run alongside of each other in superposition, okay? So they can, 
uh, contaminate each other, they can deviate, they don't have to, in a sense, provide the same kind of, let's say, uh, they, they don't have to be uh, synthesized into one substance or into the same moment in time. Okay, and I'll get into what I mean by this. So, um, borrowing uh, from Francois L'Oreal's idea of the computer, uh, I would say that Robot House is best understood as a kind of generic matrix, uh, a collider producer or detector of um, thought particles, uh, rather than a machine devoted to formal calculation, okay? So this is, I think, our idea of this kind of idea uh, of it as a conceptual installation as much as anything else. So unlike the homogeneity of the digital computer, the non-correlated parts of Robot House, uh, this generic matrix can interoperate despite their differences. So by interrupting and corrupting the computer's capacity for synthesis, interfacing, and exchange. So the computer loves to synthesize, okay? The computer always wants to translate. The computer has built into it certain kinds of uh, logics and an ontological structure that tends towards the homogeneity. Um, so this is an odd thing because in a lot of ways, you know, the digital was theorized around difference, but the computer doesn't really work that way, actually. Okay, the computer is actually all about homogeneity rather than difference. So there's a kind of a mystique of you know, a mismatch between the theorization and the actual operations of how a computers really work. Um, and, and so uh, we're uh, stripping away this, this notion of difference and acknowledging uh, the, this condition and trying to find ways to advance this. So, okay, so um, this project, if you will, Robot House, takes up residence between computational descriptions and physical descriptions without resolution, okay? So we see that there are these two kinds of descriptions of the world, okay? Um, and we see value in both of them. Um, so you could say in, in this kind of an enterprise that simply constructing non-unitary versions of the digital physical interface becomes in itself a creative act, okay? We could just say that's our interest, uh, that's a creative project in and of itself. So, um, but for us the goal here isn't uh, simply to restore earlier analog systems. In other words, we're not trying this. I don't think uh, we can actually work outside of the digital today. I don't think we can really imagine anything outside the digital. So I'm not arguing for somehow superseding or transcending that. I'm calling for a deep, what we uh, consider to be a kind of deep digitality, okay? Um, in which, um, we're also not trying to reflect on automation, but to see this conventional hierarchy of image, object, geometry, and matter, okay? This is a kind of set of hierarchies, okay? Of image, object, geometry, and matter. Those are understood to operate within a certain kind of hierarchy. Um, but we're messing with that. We're shuffling those, that hierarchy around, okay? So in other words, uh, where architecture in many ways, you know, since, um, you know, 15th century has been really about geometry. Um, we're questioning the, that as a, as let's say, the only model of, of thinking about architecture. Uh, in other words, we still have geometry, but geometry by other means, okay? So uh, image has always been seen in architecture as kind of a secondary thing and kind of superficial. We're shifting that and saying, okay, we're, gonna, we're now in an image-based culture, so um, rather than a geometry-based one. So, um, you know, why continue to be operating in the wilderness, okay? Could we not push the image uh, and into form and operate from that side and then see geometry in a, maybe in another light, okay? And the same goes with matter. So we're shifting around, uh, we're shuffling these, these, this, uh, these fundamentals. So, okay, so 
Um, uh, we've, in this case, it's kind of, we've withdrawn uh, from in the, the robot from these industrial protocols and the robots taken, if you will, offline, okay? So these are, these are uh, you know, for us, we know that this, you know, if we were really interested in construction or architecture and on-site construction, I would never use one of these robots, okay? Makes no sense to me. So we see this simply as more, uh, uh, again, a kind of a, a, an available, um, off-the-shelf, uh, tool set that, in, that brings up all of these conceptual questions and a toy really for us to play with. Um, so, um, the, this idea now of taking it offline I think is important and then the robot is broken. So what we do, the first act here was essentially to break the robot, okay, to take it offline and break, uh, break it by subversion of its technical representation that strives for perfection and objectivity, okay? Robot, um, you know, in a factory, um, which I'll talk about, but uh, in a factory you don't want, you know, wheels that aren't perfectly round, okay? So, you know, that robot has to produce that outcome in a very specific way. There's no gap, okay? There always is a gap, though. This is our point, is that, in fact, you know, Geometry and matter never really correspond, okay? That's only through huge inputs of energy do we get an approximation, okay? But, of course, our world is built around this, okay? Um, and, but we also have collapsed our world um, and made it uh, inviable through that model, okay? Because it's thermodynamically, it's impossible to continue to operate that way, okay? So this idea of, I think, taking this, challenging this kind of technical representation is, uh, I think, a fundamental idea that has other consequences and interests. So in our case, the robot arm is reprogrammed as a kind of improvisational technology as an underdetermined generic object that doesn't have a predetermined function. And in the construction of this apparatus, the robot really, as I was saying earlier, is just another object, an object among others, and an element in a retooled digital physical design interface. Okay, so axiom three, from homogeneous space, to non-homogeneous space. So um, this uh, project, if you will, playfully problematizes a whole series of assumptions regarding the homogeneous space of digitality. So here we have multiple mobile human and non-human viewpoints that mobilize space and time differently okay, from inside the computer. So most significant is the I would say one of the significant things here is this enactment of what we could call an imminentist viewpoint. That's the viewpoint that's placed within the motion material construct as opposed to operating from the outside. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why that video stopped. Um, let's see if we get this, okay. Um, so in this way, um, by uh, creating a new kind of vantage point, a new viewpoint that's within the construct, so we're not sitting outside, let's say, of this motion material uh, construct, but we're actually operating within it, uh, that this creates a kind of a new thought field uh, that's to think not about, but from out of and according to motion. So space, in this case, doesn't precede motion, uh, but it's produced through matter and movement. So working with multiple synchronous and asynchronous robot systems, as seen here, uh, and a series of innovations, we've developed a series of innovations in kinematics, nonlinear time and event-based motion control that grants reciprocal determination between digital and physical modalities, okay? In other words, there's feedback and feed forward, that they can inform each other in real time. Um, so uh, by enabling 
uh, non-Euclidean and non-Newtonian spaces, this is an apparatus that offers a far wider range of possible mappings than previous instrumentation in architecture, including the digital computer. So this flat epistemology challenges uh, the linear rationality of the grid logic, but also conventional representation and all thinking by opening up design to modelization and virtualization. So in questioning the assumed, as I was saying earlier, in questioning this assumed correlation of matter and geometry, the objective here isn't to try to reassert uh, a pre-digital or idealist materialism, but a paradigm in which the actual and the virtual always exist together. Okay, so uh, axiom four, from instrument to apparatus. So I would uh, argue, as I uh, was stating earlier, that Robot House for us isn't a machine, okay? That this isn't a machine, but a new object of theoretical thinking. So a mode of thought and sensibility rather than a web of technological events, okay? This is something that uh, clearly, again, are a set of assumptions and, and presuppositions that uh, in many, many uh, of my colleagues and theory uh, uh, colleagues have a hard time with this, okay? Have a really hard time with this because they immediately associate this with technology and a kind of technological determinism, okay? Um, that as soon as you deal with technology, you're seen as somehow not uh, one of the elite, okay? That you're too proletarian, I guess, because you're dealing with stuff that's, you know, kind of uh, dirty and so, and um, that, you know, that's got machines and so forth involved. Um, so that this is seen as maybe not uh, a, a theoretical project, but I would argue that this is the theoretical project of our time, um, that we need to actually really bust out of this idea of uh, architecture as, let's say, only operating within a cultural domain and unable to engage technology in some kind of radical way, okay? So to engage, uh, uh, critically engaged technology. So my feeling is, is that in a way, and I think that uh, this is something you know, we can discuss, but that you, know, you have to work through the technological juggernaut. You gotta go through it. You can't walk away from it or walk around it, okay? You, you gotta go through it, okay, to get to the other side. And on the other side is a cultural project, okay? But you can get to the new cultural project, you're gonna have to deal with technology. You can't simply ignore it. Okay, that's at least a proposition. Um, so, um, so what's I think one of the things that's kind of paradoxical here is that rather than accelerating automation, uh, this apparatus um, actually makes more explicit the processes by which objects make objects and how things make things, okay? So in a way kind of paradoxically, um, by engaging this uh, from this point of view, from this perspective, I think we're able to actually challenge uh, certain kinds of technological determinisms that if we don't do this, we will actually be subject to. So anyway, um, that's something to think about. So with a multiplicity of points of view and matrices of vision, um, this apparatus is a medium to uh, invent new modes of vision, okay? This is one of the things that we're really interested in, is inventing new modes of vision. Because in fact, um, one could argue that the uh, architectural speculation has always been about seeing something in a new way, okay? How do we change the way we see things, okay? How do we shift our our perceptual framework. I mean, that's really what, you know, our uh, architectural uh, uh, instrumentation has always been about since Alberti. So um, we see this as, a, in a way, a, an effort to uh, invent new modes of vision out of the collapse of earlier visual and representational models. So as an experimental apparatus, 
of superposition, uh, robot houses, I would argue, well situated, if not perfectly situated, to play with the increasing overlap in today's visual culture between the fictive and the actual, what's generated by mediated vision and image processing software, and rendered in physical form. So, okay, so um, axiom five. Um, there's only seven, so if you're getting bored, um, there's only two more, okay? <laughs> um, but, uh, and I'll go quickly. Um, so, this idea of indexicality to fictionalization. So, um, one point I think is that in the 21st century, uh, non representational aesthetics has abandoned indexicality or reference, but also many observers in scientific community or in scientific practice also note that resemblance is not the dominant requirement anymore, okay? So that the functionalities of images uh, now range from resemblance to design to visions that mobilize. So increasingly, this question of imaging is on the table across the board. I mean, it's all obviously uh, important to us in visual arts, but in science now, images are by far the most, uh, let's say, important tool, okay, for any kind of investigatory tool, imaging, 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 okay? So um, this is not just, uh, let's say, an isolated phenomenon. Um, so, this um, post-representational understanding argues today uh, that the world is mediated by technological imagery in which traditional concepts of truth, reality, authorship, original, and copy are no longer categorical. Okay, and this is something I'm going to talk a lot more about tomorrow, but this I idea of the copy. And um, so, as a uh, multifaceted experiment, Robot House aims to free theories of representation and geometry from definitions that also see geometry as the double of the world, okay? So we also are freeing in this process. We're also allowing the image to gain some traction, but also for geometry to have, in a way, its own domain as well. So what this leads us to is a new kind of form of modeling um, that's developed that allows designers to construct novel methodologies that emphasize the contingent and material qualities of computation. So these fictions, if you will, play with multiple narratives and ontologies simultaneously and point to the inadequacy of singular techniques. So there was a period um, especially at the, uh, seven years ago when we were doing this, in which generally uh, technique was very, very singular and very linear, that people would use one technique and expect to make a project out of one technique. I think that's still happening a lot, but, um, but I think that's been kind of debunked and challenged. So this idea of working on multiple platforms and multiple techniques at the same time is important to this. Um, so, um, this uh, shift uh, towards the practice of modelization and simulation is also, of course, taking place in parallel with other developments in imaging and post-processing that can draw an increasingly sophisticated series of techniques to render and manipulate images, okay? There's an explosion of tool sets that deal with imaging. Uh, and I'll also talk a little bit more about that in the, in the uh, last axiom. Um, so, um, as an apparatus of visual thinking, Robot House investigates this idea of succession and superposition, uh, the diachronic and the synchronic, and speed as well as slowness. These are all things, in a way, that Robot brings to the table, okay? They're, they're, uh, a, this idea of speed and motion, okay, is fundamental to the image. Um, and uh, this is something that allows us to explore this space in a very particular and, I think, exciting way that we can't do with just, uh, let's say, digital tool set alone. Um, so, 
Okay, so axiom uh, six, from representation to representational object. So I've been arguing that Robot House encompasses techniques and let's say proxy conditions uh, that weren't part of the original canon of transcription of static objects, okay? So we're introducing here a number of new, let's say, uh, conditions, these proxies um, that are not part of, let's say, the tradition of orthographic drawing, okay, and geometry, analytical geometry and orthographic drawing. Uh, so this is a, a new image discourse that explores the aesthetic and formal possibilities that are encapsulated in these imaging mod modalities, as well as in architectures, um, uh, traditional orthographic techniques of projected drawing by taking them up directly and working on them. So, in other words, we're not simply trying to displace one system with another. We're actually, you know, as I was saying, building up, okay? So, we still can engage orthographic projection, but now we do that with a number of, of, of let's say, new, new uh, instruments, but also new conditions in which we can do things like real-time texture mapping and so on, which I'll show you. So. Um, this uh, convergence of computing and robotics yields a new class of images and processes that cut back and forth across digital and physical worlds. So this is neither, let's say, mimetic nor semiotic. Representation is now to be understood as a system of exchanges that take place within objects, okay? within the objects themselves. So, okay, and I'll expand on that with this final one, um, which I'll get into more detail here um, with Axiom 7, from human-centered vision to machine vision. Um, so, um, this I'd, I'd like to also show uh, a few projects and more current projects um, that deal with this, um, let's say, this, this axiom. So one thing I think that we're abundantly aware of is that machine vision is in the process of fundamentally transforming not only what we see and how we see, but also the role of techniques and logistics in architecture. So um, we know that also computational uh, visual systems exist in parallel or oblique to a disciplinary history of instrumentation from Bernaleski's mirror to Alberti's window and from projections uh, to panoramas uh, and an architecture of seeing that cuts across 20th century uh, art practices. Um, so the ambition to remove the human perceiver, I would argue, is common to both Dada and contemporary non-correlationist thinkers as the human is considered a limiting factor vis-a-vis -vis what can be known about the real. Okay, so one of the interests for us in machine vision is a kind of defamiliarization, okay, that this offers us as another way of seeing. Um, so just as we problematize motion, uh, we're also now problematizing vision. Um, so, uh, as, a, as opposed to becoming, let's say, naturalized within this disciplinary. In other words, just as we said, you know, digital fabrication goes to robots, when we're also saying, no, um, uh, the, the same could also be said that, okay, we see this as a nice historical story, and I could build that story and probably, you know, uh, convince uh, you that that's, you know, the way to think about this, that okay, we have Alberti, then we have, you know, uh, pers perspective, then we have these you know, various kinds of, let's say, tools and machines, and now this is the next step. This is, and that gives it, in a sense, some kind of, let's say, uh, justification. We're not trying to do that. Uh, I don't see an interest in building that kind of a narrative, okay? Um, so, but we do know that we're messing with stuff that matters to us because we're architects and we care about representation, okay? That seeing is a very important aspect to how we work and what we produce. So um, this idea of 
uh, understanding now what are the possibilities of these new modalities um, is important to us. Um, so, uh, that, uh, but that what's I think interesting about machine vision, rather than seeing it as this continuity, okay, which would again kind of block its, its possibilities, if you will, um, too quickly, is again another kind of delay in that machine vision breaks with and exists side by side with human-centered visuality, okay, that again we have another kind of superposition here, okay. So, machine uh, vision is a different uh, gesture towards the real that does not simply displace or supersede, but that disturbs and disorders conventions of representation. That's what we are, why we have an interest in this, or in part, that's our interest. So this idea that a machine vision could be understood as the media for the inhuman, that it's neither human nor non-human and exists in this liminal, undecidable, inhuman space. So within this uh, notion, form and ground, recto and verso, past and future, foreground and background, foreground and horizon, now exist outside of any ontological hierarchy. And that this flattening leads to a different vocabulary that's not involved in conventional processes of cognition or recognition. So defamiliarizing the ways in which images and objects are constructed and perceived, these new optical regimes have the potential, I would argue, to provoke new aesthetics and themes for art and architecture. So as I've been discussing in our work in Robot House with robotics, machine vision is understood to be a retooled technology of design and that in these new scopic regimes pattern recognition dynamic processing of images and video multiple and simultaneous projections collide with geometric mappings to produce other ways of seeing that i would argue have the capacity to generate the next thing okay so um I'd like to show uh, a set of examples that are drawn from this point of view and that are, are fairly recent projects that engage now machine vision within this discourse of architectural representation. So um, estranging these kinds of default protocols of digital modeling uh, and rendering, this project series begins with a detournement of early computer graphic experiments based on the Cornell box, which is shown here, uh, which was originally aimed at correlating, again, digital and physical scenes, okay? That this is how rendering was developed, okay? Um, through this kind of comparison, these were projects, this is a, a, a research at Cornell that really was fundamental in terms of generating radiosity and all of the conventions that we use in rendering, okay? were developed through this comparative method of taking a photograph, okay, that's why they have, you know, these, these kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, proto-objects, the bunny, you know, there's, there's a series of objects that are conventionally used in these experiments so that they, they're comparative, okay? Um, so uh, what, what's done is to take a photograph and then try to match it with the rendering. Okay, so there's an idea of photo realism built into this rendering engine uh, idea from the beginning. And um, so, so where this kind of Cornell box operation uh, sought photorealism correlating renderings and photographic images, um, this work uh, operates across non-correlated clone digital and physical workspaces in parallel, in series, and in superposition rather than synthesis, okay? I'm not dismissing the value of the Cornell uh, experiment and the importance of being able to have this tool set. It's, the, it's already there. We have it. So what else could we do? You know, what, what else could we explore? Um, where could we take this? Uh, how do we challenge some of these presuppositions? I mean, we can, you know, do a lot of hacking into these tools, but um, generally uh, our interest is to try to always go under, okay, to try to dig down 
um, into the underlying, let's say, ontological assumptions and structure uh, of those, let's say, propositions about uh, representation. So here you can start to see how um, using same, uh, this is one of the, the Cornell box uh, 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 base images or base models that we uh, use, uh, Venus. So uh, essentially using and uh, uh, the, these tools in process sequences and introducing new possibilities that have to do now with image capture uh, that's now roboticized, okay? So uh, this is a kind of part, so we're trying to move this now into another discourse that's connected, let's say, also with, we're not alone in exploring this space, but there's also, for instance, in the past 10 years, especially past five years or so, you know, there's a whole series of artists that are also working in what you could call kind of from keystrokes to brush strokes, okay? Working back and forth, taking conventions that are now visual conventions and tropes of the digital and pushing them into physical world, okay? And instead of only going in the other direction, because now we have this, this uh, other sets of let's say, types of representation. So, you know, there's some very interesting art, uh, artists actually here in Germany are probably some of the most accomplished and interesting artists working in this kind of keystroke, brushstroke uh, domain um, that ha ha are uh, really, uh, I think, were influential also to us in, in exploring this space. So, um, so there's uh, a, a kind of feedback uh, between techniques that are now being fed, of digital techniques that are digital media that are now being fed back through uh, physical media. So this kind of non-correlated design paradigm ends, uh, aims to kind of play in this space, this overlap in post-digital culture between the fictive and the actual and what's generated by software and rendered in physical form. So, um, furthering this non-correlationist approach, we're exploring this kind of, as I said, a deep digitality that aims to invent this a new mode of vision out of these representational schema. So instead of a, a single uh, point of view scanning image feeds, uh, this kind of deep digitality is a multiplicity of points of view and matrices of vision. Um, so. Um, this is a, a, another series of projects that I'm going to run through here um, that take this, this uh, approach, this kind of position, um, and uh, in this case, focus, uh, this, this work focused on re-looking at the Piazza del Duomo at Pisa that was also uh, an important place, these are photographs of Le Corbusier, um, that is, is where Le Corbusier first experimented with the relationship between drawing and photography. So these are concerns, of course, that are not entirely new, but that we're operating on them with a new point of view, but that we're able to also re-establish and re-examine uh, other, let's say, uh, moments and other, other uh, architectural tropes um, that become for us in a way material. So, you know, we kind of, we, we tend to need uh, objects, okay? We need parts, okay? We're interested now, this work starts to look at syntax, okay? Of how do we put parts together in new ways, okay? So, um, this became interesting to me because um, I thought it was a, a very important set of objects and that these are understood to be uh, masterworks of medieval architecture that are seen by many as a kind of standard of architectural objects of all time, okay? Um, so despite the fact that in America these things appear on pizza boxes, you know, um, these are actually um, really significant uh, 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 objects. So, and Michel Foucault um, calls the these, this type of object 
objects of emplacement, okay, as opposed to correlated objects that are localized in perspectival space. So we made a conscience choice to go here to look at these uh, because this is pre-perspective, okay? So these are objects that are not organized based on perspective, okay? And given our interest in unsettling that uh, s space and also looking at objects in terms of this idea of non-correlation, a uh, non-correlationist point of view, this seemed to be a very powerful uh, space of exploration. So, um, it's through a kind of redeployment or mobilization of these objects across his oeuvre that Le Corbusier discovered the free plan. So these have been very productive objects, let's say, in architecture. So there's an underlying idea here um, that about uh, perception, again, as this kind of mode by which architecture becomes speculative, and also the idea that objects make objects, okay, and that new ways of seeing could generate another thing. So, um, in this project, we also mobilize and re-image these objects, and the workflow makes use of proxy objects, high precision robotics, depth mapping, projections, image capture, and manipulation in a looping workflow that produces new objects and images. So here, object properties, in this case the baptistry, are studied from different distances and points of view, providing details at multiple resolutions using massive numbers of overlapping images. So, in the creation of new parts, uh, careful consideration is given to the particular typological, morphological, and syntactic elements that make up each object, and how they may be mobilized in the creation of new objects, paying attention to the dyads part, whole, part, part. So, um, in this case, for instance, looking here at the Campanile, Tools are developed with a focus um, as on data collection now as the first stage in a transformational or cloning process. Um, so the remapping of the object slowly transforms as its image acquires new data and detail from its predecessor's mutations. So this kind of uh, multiplexing of the subject extends to what we're calling a photic materiality, a kind of fake or forged materiality that's not simply surficial, but it's actually embedded within the object. Um, which um, this goes on to uh, explore the ways in which material uh, isn't simply a texture, but is actually uh, a solid that if one cuts through it, it actually has, uh, let's say, a, a kind of uh, informational structure to it. Okay, so, um, so finally now here, I'm running through this pretty quickly, but here's now the third object, the cathedral, that's viewed as a kind of super object in this case, that's made up of a series of nested multi-temporal objects that are rendered as simultaneous possibilities as a form of, again, quantum superposition. So conjoined seams are explored here as vectors of, of two or more objects, triggering a wide range of perceptions and producing secondary axes of superposition. So the scene here is not only geometric, but also perceptual. So sets of re-imaging strategies are established here following the geometric characteristics of the architectural elements and these specific points of view are inherent in the object, okay? So we're drawing these points of view out of the object and then reapplying it to the object. So um, this work incorporates also animation, simulation, and emulation techniques that overlay digital and physical actual and virtual representations to achieve specific architectural effects, shifts in resolution and scale. 
So without fixed recipes, components and devices are addressed with an interest in the fact that anything could be uh, rather than going back to what was or might have been. So this is not an effort to reconstruct something, but to actually unpack various kinds of other syntax and other possibilities or other genres of architecture that were e either invisible or embedded. Okay, and this is an extremely rich uh, set of objects because they're multi-temporal. For instance, the baptistry is, uh, was constructed over uh, ten generations, okay, and the exterior and the interior are completely different architectural genres and so on, okay. So uh, this offers a, a very rich territory to explore some of these new imaging techniques, but also to start to think about a kind of, let's say, uh, an understanding of architectural possibilities as, let's say, hidden, uh, and that there may be whole other opportunities or other genres of architecture that were un left unexplored. So, um, and this then, as I will argue, uh, I would argue, applies to the whole artifactual history of architecture now. So, um, okay. So um, this idea now of photic materiality, I'd like to elaborate that a little bit here, um, that our work um, continues to branch out in new directions, including an interest in this idea of photic materiality, that this is a, a new materialism that's evident in the, our most more recent projects, which engage machine vision to explore legibility and to challenge directionality of the projective drawing. So, um, like Gaspard Monge's geometrical drawings in the point cloud, so this now involves scanning, which is something we do uh, a lot of, um, that, uh, that in the point cloud process, the new objects inherit relations between the points in the cloud in the studied plane. So what machine, uh, what the machine interprets always has a certain resolution detection area and allocated memory. The resolution of pixel, voxel, or point cloud can be higher or lower than the input with the machine interpreting and filling in gaps to produce a new reading. So this, what we're calling fidgetal, okay, fidgetal workflow exploits the fact that the machine can construct an object from digital information. So texture is perceived through color values of the object that the workflow produces, that this is, in fact, contrary to the photographed object where color and location correspond. They're now separated again and open to manipulation, okay? So texturing and scaling becomes an opening to this new type of photic materiality, that this kind of fidgetal substance that's neither a simulacra of digital material nor, a, let's say, a conventional notion of, of uh, a, a, an ideal materialism. So in this process, not understanding, no, let's, we could argue that no understanding of material is off limits that considering a more complex material object uh, origin, nothing is excluded from the catalog of possible building materials, including conventional building blocks, uh, but also images, uh, dust, 3D printing artifacts, and so on. So embracing gaps and fissures in, vis in visual systems, the goal's not a perfect representation again, but questions the idea of digital progress and the paradigm of technical quality. In other words, digitality seems to tend to keep moving towards higher and higher resolution. You know, like I could have been really bummed out that you don't have an 8K you know, projector here and I could have made a, had a tantrum, right? Um, and so forth, that there's this assumption again of a kind of continuous, you know, uh, uh, improvement, okay, of higher and higher resolution, and that's the goal, right? Um, we've, we, we question that, uh, and in fact have, have uh, valued this idea that in fact um, that there's a lot of uh, noise in the system is actually much more productive for us. So, 
um, extreme, this kind of extreme texturing and composing now with texture, which is something that this, the project I was uh, summarizing is involved with, um, that this idea of composing with texture, which also is, by the way, not a new idea. I mean, even Le Corbusier talks about texturique and the idea of com working with texture um, as a compositional system. Um, so, but th this also is, of course, part of uh, architecture's knowledge uh, and part of neoclassicism in this case uh, and offers us a possibility of creating another kind of oblique um, relation in this case with Ledoux uh, and these kinds of juxtapositions that we find without transition or blending um, that Ledoux in a way is kind of a non-correlationist avant la lettre, right? In which he basically has no transitions between extreme uh, texture conditions and smoothness, smooth and rough, okay? That, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, is, is just endemic to uh, architecture itself. Um, so anyway, so of course this becomes, of, uh, a, again, relevant and of interest. Um, so this kinds of, these kinds of juxtapositions are found in the work of Ledoux, but also in a number of other things, in this case contemporary uh, fashion of Rei Kawakubo, but we could also look at a number of other sources, which I'll maybe talk about a bit tomorrow, like Gucci, right now, um, that look at these kinds of extreme uh, textures and new ways or a new syntax of how to put things together. So um, this is, again, I don't have enough time to go through. We've got uh, all these different uh, projects that we've uh, worked on that explore some of these ideas and techniques, but in this case, this is a, a work that took um, uh, Le, uh, Ledoux's 50 barriere and worked, reworked them into a new set of objects, but that this in, appropriates parts and syntax from both the Kawakubo example, so in other words, how could we use the Kawakubo technique or sensibility to put Ledoux together in another way, right? So those are the kinds of games one can start to play here uh, relative to syntax. And in this case, we're using robotic photogrammetry and multiple 2D projections that make holes out of fragments and fragments out of holes. And I, I, this would be part of a longer discussion, but Ledoux is very important to this uh, work uh, because, and just in architecture in general, because he's the person who invented the part, the idea of the parts, okay, that architecture was going to work with parts, and then how we could put those parts together is what really becomes the focus, okay? And also the idea of the object is also uh, very much Ledoux's notion of the pavilion, okay, which then became kind of the basis for modern architecture. Um, so. In other words, um, you know, I, I should have maybe prefaced this that um, I don't see this as, you know, some people, have, uh, some friends call this robo-pomo, um, uh, which I enjoy, I think is a good joke, but it's not pomo, okay? This has nothing to do with pomo because it's not a historicist investigation. It's rather just architecture qua architecture, okay? Um, and as I'll show you tomorrow, we can take anything. I mean, I'd be happy, to, I work with, you know, the Hulk, could be the Hulk or it could be Ledoux, okay? So, um, so this is a, a kind of, uh, let's say, an image discourse that explores the aesthetic and formal possibilities that, that are encompassed in these new imaging modalities, in this case, machine vision, but also in architectures, uh, traditional orthographic techniques, and, and that we're working with both of these things. So before uh, moving to the final, the third and final part of my talk, I'd like to introduce um, some of the current projects that we're working on that I'll be discussing in more detail tomorrow. So um, we're working now uh, on a more sophisticated and tunable uh, machine vision and AI protocol uh, for shape and pattern recognition and that this work starts to take up 
where the multi-part works, this is something we're very interested in, is this idea of multi-part multi works. And there are two or three architects that we're very much engaged in. One is Alvaro Siza, um, who works with multiple objects, multiple parts. But the other two that are very important is James Sterling and Kazu Shinohara, that those are the three S's, it turns out. Sterling, Shinohara, and Siza, okay, are kind of our uh, source material for a lot of the, the work, this particular series of, that we're calling superpositions and supermodels, that's looking at this question of syntax and form. So um, what we've done is to build uh, a new kind of five robot stage that's coupled with the latest imaging and lighting technology. Um, and multiple objects now can be animated and suspended for image capture real and real-time projection mapping. So what, we are, what we've set up now here is, and you can see here this kind of uh, digital model, the real-time image capture and the control, the motion control model. Um, so we have all these different types of models that are in communication. Uh, but in a sense, what we've done is, is now also created a, a modeling environment in which we actually work with, with, mo with models. I mean, <laughs> literally with, with physical objects um, that we're able, that we attach to robots. So those models are put into six, six axes of freedom each object, each part, if you will. Um, and uh, we're exploring uh, various kinds of image capture and that produces in a way a, a, a condition in which we always have three-dimensional information. Even if often we'd like to flatten things because that's part of architecture's kind of, let's say, tropes. Um, even when we're flattening, we're never flattened entirely to lose three-dimensional information, okay? So we always have the 3D information so we can move in another kind of space, uh, a, a, a operational system, than conventional 3D modeling in the computer. So this idea also um, in which objects are now choreographed for real-time capturing and compositing. This also, and I'll talk a little bit about this maybe tomorrow, but this all, also also takes obviously a cue from uh, dance choreography as well, um, in which we, can, we look a lot at things like Merce Cunningham uh, in various ways in which objects can cue objects and so forth. So there's a whole nother range, let's say, of uh, let's say modeling, um, let's say uh, paradigms being explored here. And that allow us to move back and forth between digital and physical processes, 2D and 3D, the drawing and the model, and um, that this idea of objects being choreographed for real time capturing and compositing. So this idea I think starts to engage a notion of shifting from composition to compositing, and that workflows challenge the limitations of conventional 3D modeling, and that this is a new technique that my partner, Devin Weiser, is the one who's really pushing this project uh, and developing this work uh, the most. Um, she's called this volumetric compositing um, that produces uncanny geometrically and volumetrically coherent objects. So superpositions appropriates two-dimensional effects, uh, lines, strokes, fills, gradients, into the three-dimensional environment of Rhino using purpose-built grasshopper scripts, and that through positioning uh, and rotating, stroking, outlining, filling, and masking, figures are flattened from a specific um, user named or claimed viewpoint. So we have, for instance, now um, she's constructed a system where I think she's got 35 viewports, okay? And she can name any viewport as being plan section or elevation at any time, okay? So we've got these multiple viewports which can be, let's say, uh, open up uh, a, a various ways of, of reading uh, a, an object or a composition or in this case uh, this is actually a reworking of uh, Sterling's uh, 
uh, competition project for the Bibliothèque de France. So we take a lot of, uh, for, we've done quite a lot of research at the CCA on Sterling, um, who's I think an incredibly underrated architect, especially in terms of these late works that nobody really has paid a lot of attention to, but that offer I think a whole nother set of possibilities um, if now he had started this procedure of kind of loosening, shaking loose, okay? He shook all these objects loose um, and uh, that there's an unfinished project here that's being exploited and explored, for instance, here. Okay, so, um, so this, um, this uh, technique also extends to uh, designing and producing supermodels for machine vision that operates across this kind of our a digital, this cloned analog digital setup for real time lighting, mapping, and rendering of material effects. So, what you can see here is uh, one version of that setup, which also now includes projection mapping. Um, so uh, one of the things we've done is to use, try to flatten, to get rid of perspective. We use a telephoto, like a 300 millimeter lens, uh, telephoto lens on a robot that's behind me. And uh, that allows us to actually um, create a, a scene, if you will, and then use projection to map outlines and all of these other techniques that I was talking about that are basically other modes of figuration that can refigure, reconfigure figures. And it also includes things like masking, okay, which is another way of making other objects and so forth. So this is a new uh, kind of, let's say, uh, a, a, a compilation or a kind of hybridization of a whole series of different ways of mapping. Um, Okay, so um, I'll just run through this uh, video for a second, but um, so you can see here these different techniques being applied. So you've got mapping and masking and also motion and uh, of uh, physical objects and digital objects on each other and across each other and so forth. Um, and this is um, still very early stage, of very early days, but this is a whole new set of techniques that I don't think have really ever been developed in this way before. So I have to say this is all Devin Weiser's work, um, so um, I'm not uh, taking credit for this, okay? Um, but it's part of, let's say, this larger research program. I should also mention that Students are involved in all of these projects. A lot of these projects, this is actually from my most recent studio. Um, so these are generally, uh, this is a post-grad studio project. Um, in, this is one out of four projects running simultaneously on this, uh, on this platform here. So one of the things we're doing now is also combining robotics and augmented reality. Um, so uh, within a looped, uh, digital and physical workflows that generate, again, new ideas to generate and form new objects. So one of the things I think we've really been curious about is, is if we can actually um, use um, AR as a design platform and not just as a representational platform, okay? This is, this, the jury's out on this, okay? So, um, but we believe we can. Okay, why not? Um, so um, th this is a first step. This is our first AR project. Um, and so what we did um, to structure this research program is we are uh, aimed to recontextualize the promenade architecturale. So through actual and virtual movements of parts relative to one another. So what we've done is to take um, in this case, sorry, um, in this case we took the, uh, the roof of the Unité d'Habitation at Marseille, uh, which is a, 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 a kind of very significant, uh, let's say, instantiation of the idea of the Promenade Architecturale, 
um, which again, I won't get into this in a whole lot of detail here uh, and talk more about this maybe tomorrow. But that, so what we're able to do here is now to use actual and virtual movement of parts relative to one another to combine and arrange figures and effects. So this um, project now extends our work with machine vision to an exploration of augmented reality as a design tool. So starting from a process of photogrammetry, the physical is reintroduced into the digital um, by scanning both the actual and augmented reality objects. A third framework emerges with no native, but only hybrids and forms of cross-feeding and cloning. So this approach uh, to AR challenges spatial perception and assemblage of parts in different temporalities of the physical built world. So from the superposition of the two, the actual and the digital now, new organization, expressions, influences, and behaviors are generated. So finally, we, where AR like VR tends to isolate and privilege the human phenomenological viewpoint. Um, robotics has an opportunity, or our interest is not in that, in this phenomenological viewpoint, but to use robotics to subsume AR within an abstraction of machine vision and the inhuman. So, this uh, posture argues for a let's say another design paradigm in which machine vision is an agent of transformation moving beyond instruments of production to a new architecture of seeing shape and form. So this new machine ecology I, I believe has the potential to mutate definitions and understandings of the visual and architectural knowledge. So to conclude this portion here, our recent work anticipates ways in which machine vision is about to fundamentally transform not only what we see but how we see and this and going forward the role of techniques and logistics in architecture so quickly for the last uh, project um, are we okay for time yeah because I could end here or yeah um, okay this, I'll, I'll go quickly um, so what I'd like to do is to show here uh, a project, now this moves out of Robot House, um, to look at, um, at uh, our design for this uh, next generation ultra compact factory to produce this BB1 urban electric vehicle for Peugeot Citroën. So we did not, um, you know, architects always want to redesign everything. So we didn't redesign the car. Um, we took the car as a given. Uh, it's a pretty good design. Uh, it has an awful lot of parts though. So what we did is we actually redesigned the, the, the let's say, the production model of the car and its material configuration. So this is a car that's mobilized by the Michelin active wheel. Um, that's shown here, um, and that this project began with the questioning of the processes of industrial design and production to create a family of design tools, fabrication processes, and workflows as the basis for uh, new spatial organizations and new material forms. So again, this is kind of an example of this point I was making about going through the juggernaut, if you will. Our interest is in the space, not in the car, okay? We want to make a new architectural uh, object, not a new car. But in order to make a new architectural object, we had to first, let's say, understand and reconfigure the production environment itself so that we could get at the kind of architectural, uh, let's say, autonomy that we're interested in. So in a way, we had to unhook the disconnect or decouple the architecture from the production. Um, so that's really what we set out to do here. So from the beginning of this project, our interest focused on superseding the grid uh, as an organizational and spatial paradigm that of course is very prevalent in any factory and that we were interested in casting upwards uh, beyond the high-tech shed but also the late work of Le Corbusier 
For example, this uh, really important project is Olivetti, for Olivetti, the Centre de Calcul Electronique outside of Milan that combines maths, lab, or an organic form. So, um, what I'd like to summarize here are three kind of key mutations that were instantiated in this project that uh, while integral to our work, our, my firm's work as a whole, it's our experience in this case of coupling robotics and machine vision that opened up architectural possibilities within what is typically a fully optimized shed like the Tesla factory or Apple's, Apple headquarters. That the first mutation uh, is an inversion of object relations that are tied to miniaturization. So here we developed a model of production and assembly in which the industrial robot is again broken away from the linear production line, moving from the mechanical towards the nano and biochemical. So um, this is um, one of the uh, projects, one of the embedded projects here is that we inverted the typical relationship of, in which robotics now are here miniaturized uh, and shifted from acting from, you know, in a conventional factory you see the whole lineup of robots acting from outside the object, okay, on the object. Uh, and it creates a very, let's say, inhospitable, I mean, you don't want to spend any time there if you, 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 you basically, no person can get anywhere into that mix. So uh, the quality uh, has to be entirely, and the design and everything has to be entirely proscriptive. So that, uh, because it's essentially a, a fully automated line. So our, our interest here was to re-examine that relationship. Uh, and so one of the things we did here was also, this is a small car. So we essentially, what you can see here is a, a new kind of system in which the, uh, the body of the car is being produced inside these molds by robots that are actually in, inside the mold rather than operating outside. Um, so this is a kind of an inversion that radically compacts production of the car body within this series of spherical robotic chambers. So the second mutation is typological and spatial. That working on, the pro on this project, one of the things uh, we came to realize, and this is five years ago that we started this project, that we came to realize that within the factory, this wasn't a, isn't an autonomous vehicle, but is an electric vehicle. Um, but that we understood that within the factory, the car could be designed to operate as a kind of quasi-autonomous mobile robot. So with this in-wheel electric drive motors and real-time machine vision, once the chassis and the wheels, so you can see here a car with the chassis and the wheels that is now coming to, to get its body, if you will. Um, that the, this uh, basic chassis condition, this autonomous robot becomes in a way a mule that's carrying its own parts to a series of assembly and fabrication cells that can be rapidly reprogrammed. So what this does then is that like um, Saul Lewitt's loopy doopy paintings, um, we can see in these are plan studies, uh, which we did many of, but that the production line now is involuted and folded back on itself with endless possibilities to create a non homogeneous model of space. So the third mutation is at the level of architectural elements and syntax. Um, so, no longer tied to conventional tectonics uh, and industrial logic, uh, the architecture is now kind of is, is quasi-autonomous, operating at its own scale. So now we, this is what I was saying at the, at the beginning that this other effort is really not our interest. This is our interest: um, is to find a new architectural condition, uh, and that it's operating now at its own scale that's defined by its own metrics and proportioning rather than that of, let's say, the production or of the car. Uh, and that we've developed an architectural grammar and syntax for this involuted vector geometry. 
So the trabeated forms and shallow domes that we develop as a morphology are tied to a new material logistics and on-site construction logic. So continuous fiber elements are designed to be manufactured with large-scale braiding machines and packed flat for transport to the site. So what in this, in this project, which I, I'm summarizing here, uh, what we attempt is to knock down walls between research and production to rethink the way both cars and architecture are assembled, not just in terms of structure and frame, but back and forth in the context of what, in this case, Peugeot, Citroën, and vehicular transportation might become. So the, in this case, this composite architecture is, of course, in a continuity with the series of projects that uh, uh, were mentioned at the beginning, car, including Carbon Tower, uh, Johan mentioned. Um, in our work, I would argue that digital technology, machines, and robots are not an end in themselves, but a conduit to create an absolute architecture. So this is a proposition that I would, you know, I would try to align more with Miss van der Rohe um, in terms of an understanding of, you know, let's say in, the, in an earlier phase of technology, of that um, just as Mies was not uh, a technological determinist, um, that similarly our, our proposition here is really about re-engaging or re-establishing a space for architecture, qua architecture, outside of technology. Um, so, um, so in uh, conclusion, what I would say here is that this uh, miniaturization, ubiquitous computing and robotics coupled with machine vision offers a range of possibilities for architecture as both material practice but also as cultural discourse, okay? So uh, the point here is that we're going towards, you know, uh, our interest is always to understand architecture as, as, as a cultural product, as a cultural uh, artifact um, and not just as a technological object. Um, but that in our work, this includes strategically decoupling architecture from any deterministic alignment with rapidly changing technological processes and technical objects. So in both the discussion on Robot House and the PSA factory, it's not a matter of a new or stronger technics, a new type of instrument, or even a new conception of technics, okay? That it's a matter of obtaining a rigorous, non-interpretive knowledge of technics, and that this is the knowledge that's new, okay? Is this non-interpretive knowledge. Um, and it's a question of trying to capture the quantum heuristics behind any technological or technical formulation that make up our contemporary reality, that this is a formalism that is conceptual rather than technological, and it's a way, I would argue, to break out of the correlationist circle. So this is a kind of flat thinking and renewed investigation of architecture's disciplinary tools and quasi-autonomy that is, in my mind, the unexplored horizon after the digital and within the fourth industrial revolution. So avoiding the period periodizing this logic of these kinds of historical and ph philosophical postisms that I believe a design strategy can be, this design strategy that I'm trying to lay out here, uh, for you, that this is a design strategy that can be applied to the whole artifactual resources of the discipline. So, okay, so I, I, I think uh, it's probably, I'll end here, and um, I welcome any questions that you have. Um, I also look forward to um, any of uh, the further discussion, and I'll, I'll get into some other material tomorrow.
Look, I have one, just as, maybe even as a warm up for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, how important has the, has the um, um, whole academic and, and uh, experimental environment style been for formulating some of these specific positions? Uh, I would say very important um, that, I mean, this isn't an isolated endeavor, um, that this is going on in, an, in a context of a whole series of other projects and discourse. Um, so I think this is very, very much of a SIARC uh, project, uh, even though it may not be, it's not the only one, and I think that's actually really healthy. Um, that I would like to imagine that one could have five or six of these kinds of research programs going on at the same time. So this isn't the only way to pursue these questions. Um, it happens to be the one that uh, I'm interested in working on. Um, but also, I would also point out that, you know, this isn't the only way that space is used either, okay? That there are other ways to use that space and to interpret the, this framework. Yeah. Um. I was also curious about simply because, and not that I have necessarily followed very closely, but it seems that there is a twist to, to, to your, both your reading of the situation but also your taking in production compared to some of the other. Is it, I mean, I, I feel also personal and very taking, very, um, um, it's a very stimulating way that you, in fact, um, Invoke both the virtual, as say, um, and, and, the actual, and, and the actual, mm -hmm. two, that you use those two terms mm -hmm. within a, an overall discourse that also seems to, to, to place the word or position, it, position it in relationship to, for instance, the triple value. Yeah. That. I found it very, very refreshing. Cool. Yeah, I don't think what's I think to a certain extent. Uh, I know this is a little bit formal as a talk, um, but I kind of think we're at a point where we need to not just speak anecdotally, but to try to actually uh, m uh, make propositions that can be discussed and that take stances, you know, considered stances that can be examined, um, because in a way that's how we have to do, we do research. Um, so. Uh, and this work that I'm showing is mostly in that domain, let's say, of a kind of research program. But I would also say that, you know, um, that we didn't know all this once we st when we started this. I don't want to give the sense that somehow this was all, you know, just an unwinding of a, of a set of theoretical principles. In fact, I tend to believe that, um, and I, I also, I mean, this is another uh, dimension to this, but I also think history theory is, is and theory and architecture is pretty much at a dead end. Um, that I was trained as an architectural, as an architect, but also as a historian. Uh, and uh, so uh, I have a real passion for architectural history and theory. Um, and I tend to think that we've run the course um, quite a long time ago, in my uh, understanding anyway, of the techniques of, let's say, textual exegest under which history research operates, uh, and that it's time for historians and theoreticians to roll up their sleeves and, and start and, you know, get into the mix, or at least I would like to, and I know that's not going to be well received, but, um, but that's how we're going to produce new information in my mind new knowledge. It's not going to come from, again, another repassing of the same text, of the same text, and the same, let's say, methodologies of inquiry. So, um, so um, that's a kind of, you know, toss uh, uh, something out there. But um, I do find um, that, um, you know, that the interest in dis the re-emergence of an interest in the discipline, I totally embrace that. Um, I just think the techniques need to shift as well. The modes of investigation need to shift. Um, and that building an apparatus 
um, again, is, is you know, because there, there's a lot of, I have to be uh, frank about this, there's a lot of opposition to this kind of work um, from a number of different uh, quarters because it's very challenging. You know, if I spent the past 10 years building up a huge skill base in modeling and then somebody comes in and tells me, hey, you know, we're not going to do any 3D modeling anymore. You know, students are like, you know, what? Uh, that's what I came here to do, right? Um, so what is this? Um, but my, my sense is that, that, that today we actually, it's not that this is a better answer, it's that we need to have a certain kind of plasticity, right? That that's because the tools, I wasn't trained in any of these platforms, okay? My education is, is absolutely has nothing to do with this. So, um, uh, it, but it, on another level, it has everything to do with this. So I think it really starts to question our models of education as well uh, within these transforming conditions. Because honestly, when things are changing so quickly that you know, if you get skill set in one thing, by the time even you do a two or three year program, by the end of the program, everything's already shifted. So I think it's that we have to have more of a fundamentalist strategy, and I tend to be a fundamentalist in that sense, okay? That we have to kind of go to the fundamentals, drive all the way down um, into architecture, and then uh, employ and, and use techniques in a much more free and fortuitous and experimental way. Um, rather than to see the technique as being the subject matter. Technique is not the subject matter of this work. Architecture is. But it takes a while maybe to see that and to unpack that. But um, so um, anyway, I'm very stoked. I think that you know, there's a lot of fascinating work you know, to be done right now. I think we're in a really exciting time. You know, I think that we're in a really thrilling moment in which we actually uh, have uh, a whole set of new theoretical instruments and a new set of technical instruments and, and how do we engage them? How do we bring them together? So that's in part, you know, the overlay of other things is also uh, informed in the course of doing things. And I tend to also think, uh, I, I like to start out with a hunch. I tend to work with a hunch. I had no idea. I had, to be frank with you guys, I had never even seen a robot when I proposed this. Okay, I knew nothing about robots, right? And none of us did, okay? None of us had ever even worked with, we had no expertise, okay? So this is the value of architectural education, okay? And the great thing about architecture is that it exists actually in this kind of space between disciplines, right? that allows us to actually even make this hypothesis and proposition of this kind of, let's say, delay between a non-synthetic point of view is actually something that's very comfortable, to an, at least to me, as a designer. I'm very comfortable with that. But I know, you know, if I were in another domain, that would be an extremely uncomfortable place to be. But we like to be there. That's where we work. That's where architecture lives, I think, is in those kind of cracks between disciplines. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm, and again, I'm not arguing that, you know, wow, we should, every, every office and every school should have a robot house, okay? No, this is, you know, this is one of many possible ways to explore uh, contemporary, let's say, possibilities. But I do think this, this issue of, you know, engaging this, you know, the, the actual and the virtual in new combinations is really what's at stake right now. And that this was, uh, happened to be, you know, and I probably wouldn't do, I'd probably do something else now. Um, but seven years ago, this was, this was uh, the route to go. Um, and I think it's been extremely fruitful, quite frankly, that a lot of the students who have do, you know, gone into this have, um, are, been, are in enormous demand, actually, right now, because they have a unique skill set, right? That they can do something that uh, very few people are able to do. And also, 
I have to also make another point here is that working in this kind of a space that's outside of the flatness of the computer, okay, that this extreme flatness, this was also for me a kind of reaction uh, to that flatness, which I find uh, really off-putting and really limiting um, because uh, the, the spatial knowledge, which I know, again, is also a, a verboten topic, but um, an understanding of, of let's say, space. Um, once you work in this environment, um, you know, you have a very, uh, all the students who spend time working in this, uh, in this kind of an environment are able to have a much more three-dimensional, let's say, imagination. Um, than uh, working only off of the flat mode of the computer or even with physical models, right? So the other dimension to this that I'm very interested in and i talk more tomorrow, but also about a new way of thinking about the architectural model, right? That the architectural model in many ways hasn't really changed or evolved since, you know, the Renaissance, you know, if you brought you know, Michelangelo into one of these architecture schools, he'd be right away like, oh yeah, that's a model, it's shittily made, but that's a model, right? Um, so uh, there's been very little, let's say, progress and development while, while we have all these other, you know, geometric developments, the, the actual tool set that we're using for visualization is still quite limited when it gets into the physical domain. So that, I think, is probably one of the uh, also really exciting and for me anyway this new mode of modeling uh, this idea of kind of volumetric compositing um, and is is extremely exciting and fun to work with because it also starts to produce a whole new language um, uh, of form uh, so it's a new formalism as well okay good